Welcome to Caring for Kids, where we discuss physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of children in a positive, loving environment that promotes good decision making. We believe in parental responsibilities and setting an example that will guide your children along life's journey. We want to raise the issues that matter to parents and children alike. Now here's your host, Carl Krebs. Welcome back. This is Things That Matter. I'm your host, Carl Krebs. And Things That Matter is all about the things that matter. Not necessarily what matters to me, but hopefully what matters to you as well. And I want to encourage you to be in contact with me and talk to me about what are those things that matter to you. Because if they matter to you, they're probably going to matter to me as well. And I also want to encourage you to go to our website, thingsthatmatter.ca, and check out some of our previous programming. We are in the process of updating it. It's a new web page, but I have some very capable help on the way, and we're going to get that up to date so that you can use this as a resource to what's important. Caring for kids. I couldn't think of a better title to talk about something that is so near and dear to each of us. Each of us are parents, perhaps, or are involved in some children's lives grandparents as well factor into here as well. And in this segment, I want to devote a little bit of time to a situation that is developed in the Morden School Division, particularly it's called the Western School Division. And in the uh, E. Cole Morden Middle School in Morden, Manitoba, I was contacted by a parent uh, very concerned to ask if they could get a little bit of my time and bring a concern forward about something that was affecting them as a parent and their child who happened to be in that school and in a particular classroom. The teacher uh, is Janessa Kaler. And I want to say at the outset, I have nothing personally against Janessa Kaler. I've never met her. So how could I have anything against her? And I suppose that what she does in her private time shouldn't matter to any of us. Um, I remember when my friend Francine Champagne was taken to task over postings that she made about her personal views on her personal space that the LRSD school division stepped in and took very swift, immediate and harsh action against her and suspended her without pay and did that on a revolving basis to the point where she felt she could no longer be of any service and she effectively tendered her resignation. But Janessa Kaler is a new teacher in the Ecole Morden Middle School. And you can look at her Facebook page, it's fairly private, but you get a glimpse of what her beliefs are and what her passions are and so forth. And I have no problem with that. If you are uh, practicing in some kind of um, faith or some kind of movement, movement that doesn't square with me, that shouldn't be any of my business. But if you bring those ideologies into the classroom, this is where the problem starts. And so I want to read to you from a prepared statement from a parent, and I would have liked for them to be on, but they couldn't be on because they felt repercussions to both their child and to themselves, as they know that very often it's retaliatory from the other side. And that's what I was talking about just a moment ago in the example of Francine Champagne. So let me read from this statement. And this comes from the heart. Hello, I am a parent of a student at the Ecole Morden Middle School in Morden, Manitoba. I would like to tell my story. My child was excited to start the new year as a new junior high seventh grader. We were happy to go to the parents teacher meeting to meet the new teacher and check out the seventh grade hallway and the classrooms and uh, classrooms that the students would use. The meeting went fine, but I could not shake the feeling that there was something different or off about this particular teacher. I, however, gave her the benefit of the doubt and proceeded to prepare my child for the much anticipated first day of school. You know, that brings a smile to my face because I know when we were young, we always looked forward to school. So she goes on to say, when my child got home on the first day of school, I was horrified to learn that she had made all 
that she had made all the children in the classroom stay there. This is a teacher issuing an assignment. Had the children in the classroom state their name and their preferred pronouns. So on the very first day, the propaganda had already begun. We decided to give it two more days just to be sure. However, on the third day, the children were told to write an essay about what it means to be inclusive. It was clear to me that this year would be a year of indoctrination and forceful SOGI 123 teaching. I found the public Facebook profile of Miss Kaler, Janessa Kaler, and saw how she was very proud and a colorful supporter of the LGBTQ plus community. Let me just be clear that I am not a homophobic person. I have friends in the LGBTQ community who are very nice people, but it is my firm belief that 11 and 12 year old children should not be forced to participate in this type of sexual indoctrination. At the same time, there were at least two or three other sets of parents who have children in the same class who became aware of what was happening in the classroom with this obviously woke teacher who seemed to have a very obvious agenda. It's one thing to be inclusive, but it is a whole different ball game to indoctrinate the children and force feed them this agenda to these young kids. When one of the student's parents protested the principal and asked to have their child placed in another classroom, as this did not align with their personal beliefs, they were as how they were raising their children, the principal was not interested in granting the request. At first, there were to be a few of us concerned parents were asking to meet with the principal together. It seemed we would have that opportunity until he found out who the parents were and what the topic of concern was. He denied such a meeting, stating it felt like a form of bullying. He would only meet with one at a time, one parent, one group of parents at a time. Otherwise, no meetings would be scheduled. At this point, a couple of us concerned parents took our children out of school altogether and have decided to homeschool them, as we see this as a very dangerous agenda. We teach our children to love everyone. However, we do not condone the teaching that boys can be girls and girls can be boys and that they can hide their preferred pronouns from their parents with the teacher's help. When one of the parents tried to meet up with a teacher, since the principal wasn't helping, she only got 10 minutes in until the teacher threw her out of the classroom and was not interested in anything she had to say. This was Janessa Kaler. There was no professionalism, only flailing of the arms and anger and stating that she was doing exactly what the government was asking of her. She obviously was not interested in hearing anything a concerned parent had to say and was merely requesting that their child could not be taught SOGI curriculum in a classroom setting. It is my opinion that this teacher is a danger to our children and has no place teaching. I was informed by her that this was her first year of teaching and that she's in her early 40s and just got her teaching certificate very recently. Which makes it interesting that it is that if this is her very first class ever, why is she acting this way and has already lost several children from the classroom in the very first week of school and the principal is standing with her? This has made me very angry and upset because my child was so excited for the first time to go to school and then this happened. I feel we have been cheated. And now I have so much more responsibility in teaching my own child at home, but I will never have it no other way as long as I know what the teacher would be to my child's influence. It is sad that it had to come to this, but it is my God-given right to protect my child. I want to thank this parent for reaching out to me and highlighting something that will never make the five o'clock news. It won't be in any of our hard left newspapers, save for The Sun, which is under new management and under a new agenda. Perhaps we have a chance there. But clearly you can see from this letter that the parent took to themselves 
the responsibility to care for their child. I want to go back on this letter and make several reference points here. And one of them is that, um, first of all, there's a lot here to go after here. But, you know, the words inclusivity and many of the words such as inclusivity have been redefined and are being redefined. This movement takes it upon itself to take typical standard definitions and turn them into a convoluted form so that it benefits their purpose. I have never seen words being redefined until I see what's going on in this Soji agenda. And I came across a very lengthy article, very lengthy document, and Miss Kaler, Miss Janessa Kaler, is actually correct in what she says that she is doing what the government have asked her to do. Because when you examine this document, which is lengthy, the changes to this year's school policy, as were shared in an earlier segment with Sandra St. Cyr from the Louis Rail School Division, have now made their way into all of the school divisions across Manitoba. There is a policy handbook which clearly states that parents are not to be informed, are not required to be informed, should the student who is under the age of majority make choices in school as to how they identify, pronouns that they take to themselves, and their sexual uh, identity. It is abhorrent to believe that the school is going to stand in between the parent and the child. The most sacred relationship that we have is with our children. It is a God-given responsibility, and it is a trust. And it takes a parent a long time to rebuild trust when it's broken. But kids inherently, by, by nature and by majority, trust their parents. But here the student is being caught in a crossfire between what the school will allow and what the student is being encouraged to do. You don't have to think very hard on it to realize that a student, in most cases, merely wants to fit in. And I happen to know this mother quite well. I happen to know the daughter quite well. And I can tell you, this child is heartbroken to not have to, to not be able to associate with other students, which would have been her friends. And because she knew that this would never fly in her home, the daughter already knew from the moment that the teacher posed the question that this was going to be uh, this was going to result in some very, uh, very uh, deliberate steps were going to have to be taken in regards to this matter. You know, when I returned to school, our teachers were welcoming us. They were glad to see us. We were all kind of excited to be there to see who was in our class and so forth. And very often the topics of, you know, write a paper on what you did this summer, what you saw, some of your experiences, your best adventures. Tell me why it is that this teacher has to take it upon themselves to immediately focus on areas that are in the identity of the child. It could only mean that, in fact, she has been empowered by the school division to do that and is under no obligation to, to disclose any of that to the parent. It clearly states in the policy that if the school should have reason to contact the parent, they will then at that time, refer to the student by their proper name. Well, God willing, I mean, what else are you going to refer to them as? You're not going to get their names wrong. You're not going to start talking about pronouns that uh, a parent has nothing to do about, about a, a, an identity that the parent knows nothing about. But we are in a crisis mode, and we it's going to get worse before it's going to get better. And I believe that the answer, part of the answer lays in the fact that we want to dialogue with these people in the schools. And I know there was an attempt here to have that happen. But as was stated by this parent, they were met with stiff opposition. The, the principal obviously is intimidated to know that he's going to have several parents that are coming at him. And they're coming together not to bully. I, I think this is absolutely ridiculous that a principal would have to worry about bullying. If he's worried and intimidated by a group of parents, 
coming to him, it's quite possible that he is not principal material and he should be removed from that duty. Principles, at, as I knew them to be, were firm people of strong conviction that were very good at engaging and diffusing situations, but they were willing to listen. I can think of several good principles I had that when my parents had concerns, they were able to go directly to that principle and there would be some kind of action taken, some kind of amendment, some kind of consideration that would happen. But here we have a principle that shuts down the concerns of the parent. So I would like to write an article on inclusivity and send it to this principle and ask him, how is it that he is demonstrating inclusivity when in fact the very definition of what they are bringing forward is an exclusivity of parents. And this should concern all of us. I touched on this earlier that in the Roblin Mountain View area, there were a number of students, perhaps upwards of 100 students that were not registered for school in 2024. I spoke with a parent. I need to get back in touch with them to see whether or not they will come on the show and state what is concerning them. I wanna offer you some hope. And I wanna say that this uh, document that I'm gonna make reference to is going to be posted in thingsthatmatter.ca. It is a parental consent letter and it is very well done. And um, what, it, what it will allow you to do is state to the school specifically, unequivocally, clearly what you will allow your student to participate in. I believe that some will call that a right, but I believe more importantly, it's a responsibility. Take the responsibility and take the time to fill out this form and don't mail it to the school. Take it yourself and request a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the principal who is the highest authority in the school and hand deliver that letter and put it on file with your child's name on it and tell them that this is a serious matter and that you take it seriously. And that's why you've taken the time to go to the school and to raise your concerns in the form of a letter. And I encourage you to do that. That letter will be on thingsthatmatter.ca within the next day or so. I want to encourage you to, to go there and take a look at it. Hey, Canada. Do you want to know a way that you can fight against the radical transgender ideology in our schools? There's a form that you can fill out and you can bring it to your school, to the principal. It states that you do not give consent for your child to be socially transitioned, to be taught transgender ideology, to, be, to use a different name or pronoun. And it's based off a fundamental Canadian charter right, the freedom of religion. So if everyone in Canada would bring this form in, it would completely shut down the transgender ideology in our schools because they wouldn't know what to do with us. If you don't think this is a problem, just listen to what my schools in the River East Transcona School Division say in their uh, gender inclusion manual. And this is official school board policy. It says students have a right to be addressed by a chosen name and pronoun. It is not appropriate to question or challenge a student's gender identity or expression. Parental consent is not required for students in grades 7 to 12. If the school must contact the parent or guardian of a transgender student, the student will be referred to by their legal name unless the student and the parent have specified otherwise. So that means if my girl who goes to Chief Pegos Middle School is depressed, is anxious, uh, says she's thinking about being a boy, and the government worker convinces her that she should become trans, that means it's gonna be kept secret to the parents. They're not gonna tell me. And the person who's, who can help them the most in the world, me, the parent, won't know anything about it. The policy further states, students have a right to access the change room of their choice. It says students participating in gender separated sports, classes, or activities have the right to participate in those activities in the gender of their choice. If a boy decides he wants to use the girls' change rooms, the girls' bathrooms, be on a girls' sports teams, there is nothing anyone in the school, any teacher or parent can say or do against that. They have to allow it. So to summarize, the school wants to hide mental health issues from parents and they want strangers to raise our kids. They want to allow boys to invade girls' spaces, their bathrooms, change rooms, and sports teams, and they want to police how we parents think at home and how we raise our children. 
So fill out this consent form, bring it to your school, and enough people do it, we're going to make a change in Canada. Thanks. This is happening in all the divisions. The first show we did, which was early September, focused on the Louis Riel School Division. But now we know. I watched from another concerned parent in the River East Transcona School Division do his own video stating what is right in that policy handbook that I'm referring to as to what the student and what the school and what the parent can know. And clearly, they are giving rights to students that students are not asking for. Let's be clear about that. The majority of students are not requesting to be identified in a certain way. It is a small, small faction of students that are perhaps experimenting with their sexuality. And we know kids have often silly hearts, and that's what makes them children. The beauty of an of a innocence of childhood so that they can be free to be a little bit adventurous, but not in this area. Girls and boys know from the earliest mark who they are. And particularly in loving homes, parents assert that and they assure them and they affirm them that they are loved, that they are cared for, and that they are in fact a boy or a girl. And when I read this document, which I'm going to encourage you to get, and in fact, I'm going to post the whole document on the website because you need to read it. It's astounding as to, first of all, the colors that they're using clearly indicate what the bent of this document is about, what the theme of it is about, what the genre is about. It's all about LGBTQ+. It's all about SOGI123. It's all about taking our kids to an area that they don't need to go and confusing them, confusing them to the point where, as we've already stated, there is an increase of 225% in students that are now in crisis, and that number is only going to grow further and further. I learned of an incident that happened a little while ago in our area in Plum Coulee, and it involved a man who was transitioning to become a, a woman. He was of age, so we say man going to be a woman. And it, it obviously was very difficult for him. It was difficult for the people around him to know how to respond to him because he hadn't completed the procedure. Well, I, I am shocked and, and brokenhearted to find out last weekend that this young man who, who was trying to become a woman took his own life at a young age where you should just be ready to celebrate life. And I know my friend Mike, Mike Voyajakis has spoken about the uptick in suicides, in people giving in, giving up, and giving over themselves to this dark agenda. This agenda is a dead end street. And if we allow our children at the earliest ages to travel down this road long enough, Lord knows where they're gonna end up. And as one parent shared with me in the meeting on Monday, how are we gonna unteach our children that which has been taught to them. You can't unhear something. You can't unsee something. Our eyes and our ears are, are primary to the function of who we are. And it is so important that you parents take this responsibility deep into your heart and do what's necessary. I applaud this young mother. I've told her I, I'm a huge fan of hers for taking such an action. She is a a mother who struggles like any other single mom and like single parents do and even parents do to make ends meet. And she's taking it upon herself and has taken two other students from the same classroom and brought them into her home to be able to provide them with a solid basis of an education. You know, that's all we're asking for, isn't it? As parents, as grandparents, we want to see our grandparent, our grandchildren grow up to be wonderful people that contribute to our society. Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? It seems almost impossible to get the school to pay attention and afford us a basic education, which every child needs. In this case, if we can't find it within the established school districts and the schools that we have poured millions of dollars into building, we have several new schools in the Winkler area which were not cheap to build. 
But if it becomes necessary, I wonder if it's if it's time to look at taking enough students out of those schools to make it a voice that counts, to make a dent that counts. Students to teachers are the oxygen that they need to breathe. There is no teacher out there that has anything to say or anyone to say it to if they don't have a student in front of them. And if it comes to the fact that teachers like Janessa Kaler, who are empowered by the province and want to bring forward this agenda that we know is destructive to the average child, to all children, then we have to take an equal force and match their forceful agenda with our forceful resistance. And the most polite way and the most passive way we can do it is to withdraw our children from those schools. I maintain that there are no resources that are the problem. Resources are readily available if the cause is right. And I know in Winkler, it was just a few years ago that Winkler undertook to build a new exhibition center. And they did so, and I believe they went to both federal and provincial governments, and they didn't like either the terms or they were turned down, whichever it was. But Winkler, because it's Winkler, has a determination of its own, undertook to build the Meridian Exhibition Center. And at $19.1 million, they built that without any government funding. You can check the record on that. That is stated from previous Mayor Martin Harder. I maintain that we can do this. We can do anything that we set our hearts to. The only question is, it's the priority that determines our determination to get it done. And when it comes to children education, we have to be vigilant on this. They are our future. They will one day be in our stead making decisions about their children and making decisions about ourselves perhaps. And God help us that we have children that know who they are and aren't in some kind of crisis mode. Uh, I, you know what? It's almost inexhaustible. And we're going to continue to talk about these things. We're going to bring on the show um, other parents who clearly are in a position to be able to speak without any um, chance of retaliation to themselves or to their children or to their livelihood. But these are certainly things that matter.